Ever since people have been trying to think about the nature of human nature, we've had these two kinds of views. One is that the default condition would be that we would just live in a state of nature at peace with each other. The other view is that the default of human society is that people spontaneously become aggressive and violent towards each other and will do extremely unpleasant things. Humans actually love peace more than war. That, that's my opinion. I cannot imagine that soldiers are driven by aggression to do what they do. They're basically following orders. People sign up to the army to get an education, to get a job, and all of a sudden they're sent to Iraq. But I don't think when they fly to Iraq, they're in an aggressive mood at all. They're going sort of because they have to, and the situation severely traumatizes them. When they come back, uh, one third of them will have post-traumatic stress disorder because they have been engaging into something that they're not really ready for and that, uh, that humans don't really like to do. Killing somebody else is not something we like to do. I disagree. I think that modern war consists of much more than men being sent into battle against their will. A lot of it is men carrying out small platoon engagements in which they actually enjoy it and in which our psychological propensities to relish the opportunity to kill the enemy come fully into play. There's actually a lot of evidence that soldiers get very excited, even if it involves a close personal encounter with victims who they have to kill. And then they come back and then they feel bad about the fact that they felt pleasure at doing this. During the 1970s, we discovered that chimpanzees make these attacks on their neighbors. The big question was why. As the data came in, what became clear was that the chimpanzees chose to attack at times when they had an overwhelming imbalance of power in their favor. Typically something like five or six individuals at least attacking one. One individual would hold a wrist and another would sit on a leg and another would hold an ankle and now the other ones can do what they want. The imbalance of power hypothesis appears to work well when applied to humans as well. Iraqis get killed when Americans attack and Americans get killed when Iraqis attack. It's not a tremendous bloodbath uh, out of uh, a fight. It fits right in with our evolutionary history. We are closely related to the African apes, which are the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the bonobo. The bonobo is less well known, but is exactly equally close to us as the chimpanzee. I call them the make love, not war primates, because they sometimes chase each other and they sometimes bite each other between groups, but they don't kill each other. And when groups of bonobos meet, that they mingle and have sex and then they groom and the kids play, and it, and it actually looks more like a picnic than a warfare between them. It is interesting in discussing the history of human violence to know that we have one close relative who's a sort of happy-go-lucky hippie primate, and we have one who's pretty brutal. Humans have something of bonobo and a chimpanzee in them, which makes them a bipolar character. Most of the time, actually, we like to have a peaceful relationship with everybody around us. But at the same time, we can be aroused to a point under certain circumstances, either by political leaders or by an invasion or by some traumatic event. We can be aroused to a point that we start killing, and, and, and not killing on a small scale like chimpanzees do, but genocide, all of that is possible in the human species. When we are bad, we are worse than any primate that I know, and when we are good, we are actually better and more altruistic than any primate that I know. Aggressive tendencies will always be with us, but whether they translate into aggressive behavior is another question altogether. What we act on depends very much on our cognitive abilities that allow us to anticipate the consequences of what we do and to say, well, if I do this, I will get in trouble with the law, the other guy will retaliate, and that can allow us to negotiate agreements, to agree to third-party mediation, and to democratic governments that will uh, ensure disinterested justice. We have a sense of empathy which extends only to a family and friends, but which can be expanded uh, as we realize that other people are made of the same stuff and therefore feel the same pains and pleasures. But we do have to have a set of 
moral norms and a set of cultural practices that lead people not to act on their aggressive impulses. By most measures, we're living in particularly peaceable times. There's less uh, homicide than there used to be. There's less warfare, there's less genocide. So we've been doing something right. Uh, we can't really identify exactly what it is, but it sure would be good to find out. We should never think that this has come easily. We should always be thinking, now, under what conditions might we lose this? Because at any moment, when resources become scarce, when there is some kind of anarchic manifestation of society, then you can always have a danger of violence. And of course, nowadays, the dangers of violence are so much worse than in the past because of what people can do with a nuclear bomb and a suitcase. We still could be in grave danger, even if the overall trend is downward. But there are also surprisingly sudden uh, outbreaks of peace. If in the 1980s someone were to predict that apartheid would be dismantled in South Africa without a race war or a bloodbath, if in the 1970s someone were to, were to say that Israel and Egypt would sign a peace treaty which would survive for 30 years and counting, even after its architect Anwar Sadat was assassinated, they'd all say, what were you smoking? Uh, that uh, it's impossible that you could have a transition to peace that sudden and unpredictable. The main incentive for conflict resolution, and that's where we need to work, is uh, the value of the group and the value of relationships. If individuals recognize that their relationships are valuable to them, they will try to suppress conflict and try to uh, ameliorate relationships after conflict has occurred. After World War II, that was the main reason of setting up the European Union was to get France and Germany in an economic pact so that they depend on each other for their economies. You're basically then increasing the value of their relationship and hoping that peace will follow. And, and it did in Europe. It would be foolish to predict that conflicts such as India and Pakistan will be solved or Israel-Palestine, but it's not out of the question. Uh, stranger things have happened.